G'day, everybody, and welcome to another DUC Migrating to Australia podcast. My name's Wes Sand, and today I'm joined by Zoe Marta. So, uh, Zoe, welcome. Thank you. Hi. So um, we're uh, we're actually mates on Facebook, so I sort of get to see what's happening in your uh, mm-hmm. in your life. But um, let's uh, let's start with um, with where you're based. So you're based in South Australia. Whereabouts are you based? Yeah, so we are in South Australia. We are south of Adelaide, about 40 kilometres away, um, I think. Um, And we are in a place called Port Nalunga South, which is right on the coast, which is beautiful. Nice, nice. And um, in your family, you've got uh, Charles, who's six, um, Jesse, um, six months, and you've got your partner, James, um, as well. And, and And you were the main applicant and you're a nurse? Yeah, that's right. So I've also got a dog called Bonnie. So she's um, almost three now. But yeah, so I was the main applicant in our original um, visa. Yep. So um, I'm a registered nurse. And yeah, we kind of, we, do you want me to kind of talk about where we started or? Yeah, well, let's, yeah, let's, um, let's, yeah, let's start there. So um, where about to you guys from originally? Okay, so we are from the east of England so East Anglia so I am from a place called Norfolk um and James my husband is from Cambridgeshire so they're kind of like really really close together that's where we grew up um and then yeah then we both he moved over to Norfolk with me um so yeah we're from there which again is by the sea and by the coast so we're kind of used to that life anyway so that was a must when we when we came to Australia we needed the beach life (laughs) Yeah, I think that sort of goes hand in hand with the um, with Australia. What lots of um, pommies think about it, isn't it? So, um, did you guys ever um, have you been to Oz before? Yeah, so we actually came out in twenty. It was the end of twenty fifteen, beginning of twenty sixteen. We came out on working holiday visas, oh, cool. um, and yeah, so we originally flew into Brisbane. And we, it's actually, it's, it's a really long story, but we bought a car, um, a Jeep Cherokee, and we lived in the back of it and traveled the whole circumference of Australia. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we spent a long time doing that. We spent about six months, I think. And then, In a Jeep as well. Jeeps are quite small. Very cozy. Yeah, it was tiny. We had the back seats removed, made it into like a, a bit of a bed um, and just slept there. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> stayed awesome. at kind of free camps and um showered when we could but yeah it was really good fun um but we ended up staying in melbourne for a good few months and basing there too so we worked there for a little bit and then just carried on on the loop so but yeah that was eight years ago um just over so and yeah. did you do the working holiday visa or how long were you on the i'm oh, sorry did you do um harvest work or were you there for one year or more than one year uh, so we were just there for one year um we attempted to do the farm work um but we actually did it up in Bundaberg in Queensland and we picked to do it in the summer, which wasn't ideal. So it was no. 40 plus degrees and I was picking sweet potatoes out of a field and it just wasn't for me. So I lasted three days. Okay, nice. <laughs> nice. Well, how was James about that? Was he like, come on, Zoe, we've got to, you know, get more sweet potatoes done to stay longer or was he just well, like the same? No, too hot? He was lucky because he got put on a really good farm and he was chainsawing trees down in the shade so he he got pretty lucky there um but yeah I was put on a sweet potato farm so yeah it wasn't wasn't good for me well there's your first um lesson listeners if you are on a work and holiday visa remember Australia is a very large country and when it's uh when it's winter in um you know your sort of Sydney Melbourne Adelaide times it gets very hot at the top of Australia and um your Queensland area so try and do pick those areas in the winter times which is Pretty much from, I don't know, I'd say, what do you reckon, Zoe, from April to sort of September would be yeah. a, little light, you know, a, a lot cooler rather than working in those hot areas. Yeah, we chose January in Bundaberg and I don't recommend that. So no. yeah, anything out of that, I'd recommend. <laughs> yeah, January, February is like really hot in Oz, um, no matter where you are. I know when we travelled Australia, like, gosh, yeah, I'd avoid those places um, being a borderline ginger, those places were not um, not fair for me. Um, and when you were traveling, Oz, was there any sort of certain places you were like, wow, this place blows my mind? Oh, 100%. I mean, for me, I mean, we'd originally we decided to, we wanted to focus on the East Coast. But as we were going around and we were doing more research, the we, when we got to the West Coast, that was my favorite. Like anywhere up sort of Exmouth Broomway, 
that was just beautiful. We did the Ningaloo Reef and that was my nice. favorite place in Australia. Um, like swimming with the whale sharks. And um, I mean, we were in the water and we had a minky whale come underneath us and there was dolphins and turtles. It was just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It does, so, sound, yeah. It does sound pretty cool. So, yeah. all right. So you do your work on holiday visa and everything like that. And then um, after that, how long were you back in the UK before you wanted to um, start the process? Uh, so we got back um, 2017, we decided to buy a house in the UK and then we got pregnant pretty quickly after that. So we had our first child in 2018, um, Charles, and at the time when I was on maternity leave, I was like, okay, we really need to focus on getting our permanent residency. So that was where our head was at. Um, so I did all my skills assessment. I did sat the IELTS test at the time. Um, I have to ask Zoe, what score did you get? Um, the top, I got nine, I think nine, 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 nine or something like that. Wow. That's, that's literally the best you can get. Yeah. Yeah. I got really lucky. I don't know what happened. I must've been having a good day. Um, (laughs) but yeah, so we did, we did that. Um, and then, yeah, I was on Matley, so I had loads of time to kind of dedicate to it. Um, and I put in our expression of interest for a 190 of Victoria. This is off our own back. So this is kind of just the research that we had done. Yep. Um, yeah, it was about September, October time of 2019. Um, put in expression of interest for a 190 for Victoria because we wanted yep. to go back to Melbourne initially. Yep. Um, and then we got an invite really quickly, actually. So I think it was like, you know, just a few days we got an invite to apply. And so we were like, oh, my gosh, this is great. Um, and then they said, because I'm a nurse, they were like, oh, you know, where's like, we need your art pro registration. And I was like, what? I didn't know I needed to do that yet. Um, and I hadn't done it. So I wasn't going to get my art pro within the, however long it was going to take to lodge. Um, so we had to pull our application, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I had to do my art pro registration. So I tried to fast track it. And um, if there's any nurses listening, there's like kind of two different ways you can go around it. You can apply directly to art pro, which is the Australian registration, or you can apply through the New Zealand route and then transfer it. Um, so I chose to apply to the New Zealand route and then transfer because apparently it was quicker. Um, but it still took about 12 weeks. And by that point, um, we then applied again, didn't get an invitation and then COVID hit. Okay. (laughs) So yeah, we kind of put it, we just didn't get an invite after that because obviously they kind of stopped everything, um, put everything on a hold. So yeah, we kind of got a little bit, um, stuck in a rut there. Um, but yeah, at the time, I mean, I was so busy with work. I was put into adult ICU and I was running clinical trials for COVID. So I was really busy and we just kind of didn't think about Australia for a little while after that. Um, and then it got to the point where obviously in the UK, things were pretty dire around that time as there was everywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, but we decided that we really wanted to give it another go, but we had no idea what to do or how to get here. So that's where we found the DUC. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> there's a fun fact for you actually started with us on the 8th of the 1st, 2021. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. That's so funny. Did you say yeah. January? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. The 8th of January, 2021. Um, oh, lovely. Yeah, which is good. And then you, um, it wasn't much after that, then you were actually able to um, to lodge your visa. Um, yeah, that was actually done on the 15th of the 2nd. There you go, yeah. 2021. Um, so we got you through that process, um, which is good. And then from when you got your visa granted to um, actually moving to Australia, how long? So this was really, really quick. So obviously, yeah, we joined DC on the 8th of the 1st. Um, lodged around February. We got our grant on the 30th of March, so six weeks later. That's so quick, Zoe. That is so quick. <laughs> I know, I know. And do you know what? I think in hindsight, I think the reason was because my so my um, skills assessment and what we kind of lodged under my occupation was registered nurse, critical care and emergency. Gotcha. And because I'd had all the experience in COVID, I think they were just like, oh, she might be able to help with the pandemic. So they just yeah. kind of shot us through basically. Um, so yeah, we got granted on the 30th of March and then I got a job offer in April. So a couple of weeks later, and then we actually moved on the 8th of July is when we left the UK. So it was really quick. 
<laughs> and it must have been tough, I guess, you know, obviously being quick, you got the job offer, you've had a taste of Australia, but what about the grandparents and all that? Because um, mm-hmm. obviously you got young Charles, he would have been quite yeah. young at that point, and the grandparents think, oh, no, he stopped taking our grandson away. Well, how, how did they go with it all? Yeah, they were really good, actually. So we were really close to my parents. I mean, we still are, um, but we used to see them every single week. My mum used to care for Charles for us, you know, once or twice a week as well. So we were really lucky and really supported by them. Um, But they always knew we were going to come back. Uh, I think as time went on, they were like, oh, maybe they're not going to go. And when COVID hit, they were like, no, we've got them for a little bit longer. Um, but when we did tell them, we kind of made it a little bit fun. So we got them all around for a barbecue and we did like, it was around Easter time that we told them. So we made like a little treasure hunt in the garden with letters that spell out Australia. Oh, <laughs> and that's, that's how so we told them that we were moving. Um, and they cried, obviously, but they were really supportive and they helped us a lot um, with the moving and selling and, our house and everything. So. And James's parents were involved in the treasure hunt as well? Uh, oh no so James's mum couldn't make it he unfortunately lost his dad before we started all this process um but yeah his mum wasn't there at the barbecue week I think I can't remember how we told her to be honest it must have she must have just come around for a cup of tea or something and we told her then but yeah but yeah that everyone's just really supportive of us but I've got to ask Zoe was it like a common thing for in your family to play little games like treasure hunts or was were they thinking Zoe what are you doing you know, like, were you making us do this? Or they were like, yeah, let's do it. It sounds like a fun game. And then bang, they spell out Australia. Yeah, they probably thought I was a bit crazy, actually. Um, and I also, I found a koala um, Easter egg as well in M&S. So, um, yeah, I got that. That was the kind of the main prize. <laughs> my nieces were there and they were quite young at the time. So, um, yeah, they enjoyed it. But, yeah, my parents probably thought I was a bit crazy. <laughs> uh, it's such a cool way to do it. So it's really good that you guys got support from, um, from the family, especially when... I think, you know, at the moment, um, people are waiting a long time from, you know, lodging a visa or, or, or even like, you know, getting their invitation to apply, you know, it's taken like 12 months now to get a visa granted, yeah. obviously, depending on your occupation. Um, but yeah, they've got time to sort of adjust and, and sell houses and do all that. So even with the house, you mentioned you bought a house. So w- what was that like? Just straight on the market and it sold quickly or do you still yeah. have the house? Yeah, no, it was really stressful, actually. So we put the house on the market. I think we wanted to wait until we got the grant. There was no way that I could have sold the house before any of that because I'm just too, like, I'm too much of a stressy person. Um, So we, yeah, once we got the grant, we decided to, I know the job offer, then we decided to put the house up. And it actually sold within 48 hours. Um, Yeah, so we actually had some open houses, like some dates booked in. And we had, we had a really high interest at the time, there was about 12 or 14 people within the first day that wanted to come and view it so we were going to put on an open house the following week but then um the following day it turned out my cousin actually um put in an offer like straight away and just said can I pop over for a cup of tea and we were like yeah sure and he was like I want to buy your house Um, (laughs) I'm surprised he didn't make you do a treasure hunt (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't really say no to him, um, but he offered us the asking price, which is all we wanted, really. Um, and yeah, he so he bought it straight away from us, and so we took it off the market, and um, that was it. That's awesome. Yeah, that is so good. Yeah, Honestly, really that's lucky. So good. It's um, I like when that happens. Actually, I think um, yeah, it's so um, it is. It's really challenging, isn't it? Everything's challenging, obviously, about it migration. Is. But you look at the houses, telling parents and all that. And then, what about all the furniture and all that was in the house? Did you decide to come to Australia? Um, you know, minimize everything, or did you decide to ship things over? No, we actually decided to get a shipping container. So we got one of the twenty foot. Um, containers yep. and we shipped our entire three-bedroom house <laughs> everything included um, which in hindsight I probably wouldn't do again because we had so much clutter and so many little things that we just didn't need to bring here um, and then when you get here the other thing is I mean we bought our sofas and our beds and everything which we've since sold our beds because they just didn't fit with the themes of the house that yeah the that we were getting here and the furniture's a lot smaller in the UK than it is here. I mean, our, we still got our two old sofas from our lounge room in the UK, but they just sit in this room up here and it's just, they look tiny. Yeah. <laughs> the rooms are so big here, but I mean, yeah, we shipped the whole house, to be honest, just everything came with us. And how from, from when you guys arrived to actually getting the um, Christmas day, as we'll call it, when the 20 foot container arrives with all your goodies, how long was it? I think it was eight weeks. Oh, that's pretty um, good. 
yeah, really good. We went with, um, is it PSS, the, the people that you guys recommend? Oh, yeah, PSS. Yeah, they're yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So we actually shipped everything a month before we left the UK. Um, and we just slept on camping mattresses and camping chairs um, for the like the final month that we lived in the UK. And then when we got here, we actually met um, some really, really kind people. Um, I think they were from DUC, actually. And they lent us like a sofa. Um, who, who are they? Name drop and I'll see if I remember. Um, oh, my gosh. What's their names? Oh, my gosh. This is awful of me. I'm terrible with names. Well, this is why we do the live podcast, listeners. Um, it's funny, actually. While you're trying to remember the names, whenever yeah. we whenever we do like the recording um, to the listeners, I'm like, let's just get straight into it because then it's not scripted. Um, yeah. So your poor thing, Zoe, it's just um, throw you under the bus here, but um, that's all right. Well, at least, look, they probably were DUC clients and it's good It's good that people that have been through it can um, can help you on the ground and that's the whole purpose of our, you know, private Facebook group. Yeah. You know, not to be given the migration advice, leave that to us, leave it to the experts, but that, um, yeah, that support on arrival, um, you know, pre-arrival, preparing everything. So you just get here eight weeks later and all that, your um, all the gear comes and everything from your container. What about cars and all that? Did you just get a car straight away? Did you decide to wait on that? Yeah, we got cars pretty much straight away because, I mean, well, first of all, we had to do two weeks hotel quarantine. So that kind of took up some time. Oh, where did you do that? We, we actually landed in Melbourne. So we were at the Holiday Inn in Melbourne um, initially. And then because it was... At the time, I mean, this is a really long story, but basically we had three flights that were cancelled because it was COVID. And in the end, we left with 48 hours notice. So it was a bit of a scramble to find any flight to get here. So we had to fly to Melbourne, do two weeks hotel quarantine, and then we had to fly up to Canberra and then back down to Adelaide. Um, so it was it was just a ridiculous time, wasn't it, COVID, when we look back? Was, was um, there many people on your flight? No, no. So we had 12 people on our flight. From- <laughs> yeah, we, we we had something similar, like, but ours is actually reversed. It's quite funny, oh. this, because I actually, um, we got the flights. We were very lucky. We didn't have any cancellations and we had the two young boys. But I got a photo of the flight and um, there was no one. We were like on the, I don't know much about planes, but like the, the back end of the plane in that one of those sections, there was not one other person or family. We had, we had exactly the same yes. um, and I've got a photo of me like putting the mask on and then behind me there's just empty seats everywhere yeah. but they actually um took us to um you don't get a choice do you and um we actually ended up in South Australia in Adelaide oh, okay. did the quarantine there and then when we got freed out then we got on the plane to Melbourne That's so amazing. we should have just swapped flights shouldn't we I think yeah. we came around the same time didn't we when did you get here uh July 21 Oh my God. Yeah. I was here. Um, we arrived, um, September 21. Right. Oh, how funny. Yeah. yeah, no, we were the same. We had the whole middle section of the plane to ourselves. Um, so we just like, we just got to lay out and just choose where we wanted to sleep, which was really handy. Who did you fly with? Do you remember? Uh, Singapore Airlines. Oh yeah, we, we were the same. And the, how nice are the, um, the air hostess and everything. They were so bored that we had the two kids. Um, oh my gosh, what they would have been like well one was dressed as a turtle so Jackson <laughs> was quite young because he um yeah he was literally dressed as a little turtle for some reason um and then Jet was in his little UK um soccer top um uh, I remember that um yeah and then I just remember sort of usually when you're in flights with young kids you sort of stay awake and you try to be a good passenger for all the other passengers because it's a long mm-hmm. flight and I remember just them saying just go to sleep it's fine so I, um, both me and my wife just pretty much slept and would wake up and the kids were entertained by the air hostesses. It was so good. Amazing. Horrible, yeah. horrible time, but like the best flight ever because yeah. if you move, they're offering you a drink or a snack. Like, yeah, no, we and- were um, really, really lucky. But we, we had a bit of drama actually on our way over. Um, so the first flight was amazing to Singapore. Like like you said, we got the middle section to ourselves. The air hostess was amazing. Um, Charles was only two at the time. So he was, I mean, he was loving life running up and down the aisles. It was great. Um, but we got to Singapore and then we were about to board our flight to Melbourne. And you have to go through security again in Singapore um, yeah. before you get on your next flight. Um, and James, my husband, had brought his keys along with him. Like, I don't know what was even on them, just a couple of key rings. Anyway, so me and Charles go through first through security. And then we, we're through the other side. And then I'm like, oh, James isn't coming. Like, they're not letting him through because they'd stopped him. And they'd said that he had something 
on him um, that was illegal and couldn't go on the plane, basically. So he, a load of armed police officers arrived um, and he was basically like detained in the airport because he had an old key ring, which was an old um, bullet casing, which was his late father's. It was like a key ring. Oh, you can turn wow. Key. It's a gun cap, thought, potentially. Yeah, they thought he had ammunition on him. So he got stopped and wasn't allowed on the flight. And it was really, really scary. Um, and yeah, so they made me and Charles board the flight. Um, to get to Melbourne and then at the last minute because I was like I kept saying to the air hostess I was like you need to, my husband needs to get on the flight as well like I can't do two weeks hotel quarantine with a two-year-old by myself like this is just horrific wow um, yeah and in the end they obviously saw sense and um, I mean they seized it off him but they let him on the flight but it was really scary at the time because it was a good like you know half an hour that he was basically being questioned by these police officers in Singapore and that half an hour will probably feel like a few hours yeah yeah, it was. Thinking, surely, guys, there's a million seats here. Even just like sit a, sit someone next to him if he's going to shoot yeah, up. Exactly. Something. Like just let That's... him in Australia, please. <laughs> yeah, it's they're full on up there. I love the airport. You can buy water in the airport, but you can't like bring it in to the no, plane. No. But they empty it out for you. It's like, all right, thanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little mistake. Well, that's good. Well, look, so you arrived here and everything. And um, so how's life now? Like, what do you guys, um, you know, if we refer to as life, you know, what's a, mm-hmm. what's a normal weekend like now for Zoe and the family? Oh, normal weekend. So besides the swimming lessons and soccer lessons for my eldest, um, we tend to just get outside all the time. Like in the UK, we never, we weren't really an outdoor family. We'd go for the odd bike ride, but it was mostly like seeing family and staying inside or something. Whereas here, I mean, we can walk to the beach from our house. We're pretty lucky. So um, my husband um, is a turned now turned into a surfer. Um, so he goes surfing pretty much. Every <laughs> weekend. Um, and we'll just head down to the beach, go for some walks. Um, is, he, is, he, is he a nice surfer? When I'm in a nice surfer, I know sometimes you can be stuck out in the water for six, seven hours. Is, is he good? Does he come in for breaks or is he kind of like, all right, Zoe and the kids, I'm off. I'll see you in a few hours. What's he oh, like? Nah, he comes back. He comes back. So, yeah, he's always coming back to check on us. Um, and, I mean, because we live so close, he can just hop back after an hour if the surf's not great. And, like, yeah. I think this morning, actually, he, he went out this morning and he's going to head back out this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, we pretty much live the life. But, yeah, in the summer, I mean, in the winter it's pretty hard. But, yeah, surfing's better in the winter here. Um, but in the summer, we tend to go paddleboarding a lot. Um, we had a kayak. We sold that, though, because we weren't really making the most of it. But it's mostly paddleboarding, going down to the beach. We've got a drive-on beach near us um, called Moana, which is really lovely. So we tend to, in the summer, even like after work and after school, just drive onto the beach, grab some chips or load the barbecue in the back and just have some sausages or something on the beach for dinner and just watch the sunset. But, yeah, we're pretty much outdoors all the time. <laughs> yeah no I love it I, re- I reckon it's so good and is is that sort of like when um how you envisioned Australia I always ask that question on the podcast but you know is it is it what you thought is it better is it worse is it on par you know just to manage expectations um so I think I grew up watching Neighbours and Home and Away so I had this um like vision in my mind that I was going to be on Summer Bay or Ramsey Street and just yeah and I, it is like that it's, it's weird but it is it is just like being in summer bay like I'm always at the beach um but yeah it's definitely surpassed my expectations even having been here eight years ago um actually living here is just I mean you have to pinch yourself sometimes to think that it's actually real I mean obviously you still have your you know you still have to go to work you still have your your family issues or whatever else is going on in life but it it does make it easier kind of being here and just it's a bit of a slower paced lifestyle, um, which I really like. So, yeah, I just love it. I think um, Home and Away, isn't that filmed in South Australia? Is it? I thought it was filmed in New South Wales. Um, I don't know. Here we go. I have to Google this one. Yeah. <laughs> the exterior scene is filmed in the Palm Beach and the Fisherman's Beach in Calaroy interior. Oh, you're right, in, um, in the Sydney studios. There you go. Uh, yeah, I thought it was up on the coast. Um yeah, because obviously Neighbours was Melbourne, wasn't it? Yeah, Neighbours is like pretty much where I used to grow up. All the um, oh. yeah, there was a period there when um, I won't mention names, not me, obviously, but lots of people used to egg the um, the Ramsey Street bus, the Neighbours bus. <laughs> okay. um, it was like a tradition, I think, each, as your kids grew up. Um, yeah, so used to do that. 
So, but it oh, is, it's, it's, it's like that and it's different. It's so, I think it's choosing where you live in Australia is, um, is really important. So we spoke before a bit about, um, you know, how you guys liked Melbourne and you're going to um, come mm-hmm. to Melbourne. You end up coming to Melbourne on the, to quarantine. Mm-hmm. Um, but why Adelaide? Why did you end up choosing Adelaide in the end? Um, so we came on a 491 visa. So that means gotcha. that we had to live regionally. Yeah. Um, so initially we had looked at Tasmania and we'd oh, looked wow. at the, and we'd looked at Perth as well. Um, we've never actually been to Tasmania. We never did that when we were traveled. We just stayed in the mainland, yeah. um, but we'd been to Perth before and I did like it, but it was a bit too remote for us. Um, yeah. so we, we'd passed through Adelaide, um, years ago, but we hadn't actually spent much time here, but it looked amazing. And we thought, why not let's just give it a go even if we just do it for you know until we can get our permanent residency and then see where we go um but I could not imagine living anywhere else now I absolutely love Adelaide it is Australia's best kept secret to be honest so actually no one come here because I don't want anyone else to ruin this little spot <laughs> but no oh, I'm don't, look don't worry all Lisa does is bring people on for me to interview from South Australia it's a thing she's got at the That's moment so funny. no but, it's um, just it's just stunning here. I mean, the beaches here are the best that I've seen in Australia. Besides, what, what the makes them the best? Is it is it just because they're um, you know not as busy, or what? What makes them the best, though? So oh. it's not it's not commercialized like it is on the east coast. Or I mean, I wasn't a big fan of Melbourne beaches anyway, to be honest. Except from the Mornington Peninsula, that was probably the nicest bit. Um, That's where I'm coming in live from. There you go. Oh, lovely. Whereabouts? Um, I'm just uh, like Rye, basically. We've actually got an office in Rye down in St. Anne's. Okay. Rye, right? we, um, we stayed in Dramana for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So we're um, we're at the tail end. Like my boys go to um, the Sorrento Primary and all that. Oh, um, so, Lovely. yeah, the peninsula, is, it's really good. But compared yeah, yeah. to the other Melbourne beaches as well, it's not yeah. – um, the closer you are to the city, then obviously it's a bit – it's a bit different, isn't it? Because more people rock up and yeah. you've got your space. But we we can cross the road where we are. Um, we're on the street back sort of thing, I guess. And we cross the road and um, nothing, no one. Yeah, beautiful. And that's what it's like here. Like, so we, um, so our local beach is called Seaford Beach. Um, like I say, we're like, you know, 40 kilometers south of Adelaide. Um, but there is just no one's there. Like, even in the peak of summer, I can just walk down the steps onto the beach and there's probably like three families on the beach and that's it. It really does not get busy here. So we can just walk the dog at any point. The boys are safe and can just go and play in the sand. Like, it's just, just stunning um I think you know as you get like you say as you get closer to the city it gets busier um and the beaches up sort of you know west of Adelaide are really beautiful as well and they're kind of like the picturesque white sand beaches down here it's a bit more golden but it's still just stunning and yeah just love it how do we um we mentioned before that you've got um Jessie who's six months old um Mm -hmm. and when Charles was young used to say that your your family used to help out a bit how do you go about um having the six-month-old um are you working at the moment? Are you full, are you um, maternity leave? Would you get childcare? How does all that work? Yeah, so I'm still on maternity leave at the moment. Um, I'm going back to work in three weeks, actually. So he'll just be near enough seven months when I go back. Um, but no, we don't get any support like we did in the UK, which is the downside to having a young child here. Um, and because we're on a 491 visa as well, it means that we don't get childcare subsidy. Um, yeah. So full fees, I mean, back when my when Charles was two, three, when we got here, he went to daycare four days a week and yeah. we used to pay $600 a week for that. Wow. Um, whereas now, I mean, he's been at school for the last, in school and kindy for the last year and a half, so we haven't had to pay much fees there. Um, but now we've got Jesse. Um, the fees have gone up a lot, and now we are paying $160 a day for him to go to daycare. Um, so he started on Tuesday. He started daycare on Tuesday. We're doing like a slow transition for him um, just to get him used to it. Um, but yeah, he just got, he's just going to go twice a week. Um, but yeah, it's going to cost us, I think it costs us $960 every three weeks or something like that. It definitely adds up. We're the same thing, um, in the UK. I mean, obviously, um, my partner's British. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, it was, um, it's expensive. That's the problem I think with a 491, if you've got young kids that, you know, you're, um, yeah, it does make it challenging, but so you'd be, you'd be very close to applying for your 191 then. Yes. Yeah. We applied for it um, two weeks ago. Oh, wow. 
Jeez, yeah. my, maths, my maths is getting good. Yeah, so you would have literally, yeah, two months ago, yeah, for the 191. So so for the listeners out there, that's a transition from a 491 to a 191 where um, Zoe and their family are going to be applying for their permanent residency visa, which yeah. equals out pretty much like the 190 or the 189. So, um, yeah, that's good. And um, do you have a, do you know roughly how long till you'll hear back? So I think at the moment it's taking about five months for them to process. Um, yeah. But that's, I think they're, they're just finishing up the applications that applied in January or February at the moment. Okay. Um, but I think there was a little bit of a hold up, I guess, as we were coming into the new financial year. I don't know. Right. No, that's a big factor with it because yeah. they all the case obviously get busy and immigration sort of slows a bit and then they, they try to focus on something in the area where they're going to pr- um, process lots of other visas that might have been dragging behind in that financial year. Um, the yeah. migration sort of stops in July. Um, even now, like the start of August, oh, today's the 1st of August, there you go. Um, mm-hmm. Even now we sort of expect lots of invites to sort of be happening later this month, mid this month to September. Um, yeah, so if you've got an invite in, guys, the states are sort of, um, you know, at the moment, this is filmed on the 1st of the 8th, 2024, but um, the states have released um, numbers, but they haven't really, really released their list yet and they haven't started inviting. Um, so fingers crossed. Yeah, they get all that done. Um, so, okay, so, and um, Charles with school, how's he going? Like, um, obviously, he started school in Australia. Is he um, adapting his school, what you thought it would be? Yeah, I mean, he's such a little Aussie kid. Um, he's got the accent and everything. Now he says water. So, yeah, he's um, really settled into into life. I mean, because I think when, when we first got here, he I started work within, like, a week. So he had to go to daycare really quickly. Um, and he's just been in in that kind of system for the whole time that we've been here now. So he's all of his friends are Australian. He's gotten really used to just the way of life here. He doesn't remember anything about England. He doesn't remember being there or what our old house was like or anything. Um, but yeah, he absolutely loves school. He's thriving. He's doing really really well. Um, after school, he's taken to wanting to go to the Oval and play soccer. Uh, with yeah. his mates so yeah and he's yeah barely six so he's yeah he's doing really really well they just grow up fast don't they like especially yeah. when they're outdoors um yeah. i was um coaching the i do coach on the wednesday night for the footy and then um our kid, and that's aussie rules footy but my son and a few of his mates half of my footy team actually we're all playing soccer um and i'm like come boys let's go gotta get you know gotta get to the footy oval um i guess the school's near where we train at the serrano footy oval <coughs> excuse me and they just don't like they just want to just keep running around. And you're like, what did you do today? Oh, for sport, we did kickball. And then we did this. And then we actually played lunch, you know, footy and footy, 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 this, footy, that, footy, that. And then now it's soccer a little bit. And they just don't stop. And we're in winter, you I know. know. Like they just it. do not stop. Yeah. I mean, the only we do soccer every Sunday. So he plays like, um, I don't know if you've got this in Melbourne, like grasshopper soccer, just like a little fun. I'll be like Oz kick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a bit like that. Um, so we do that every Sunday morning. Um, and the only time it's been cancelled is when it was like 42 degrees, like every other time they just carry on and they'll just play rain or shine. Not that it rains much here anyway, but they just don't stop. It's just constant. Yeah. And after school, they're just wanting to play. It's just, yeah, always on the go. And how about you and how about yourself and, um, and James, how's, how's life for you guys, like making mates and all that sort of stuff. Was it easy to make friends? You know, James is happy as well. I mean, he's surfing and that he's living his dream, I guess, yeah, he's he's out there for a while. Yeah, so he's um he only decided to start surfing like probably eighteen months ago. He was like, I'm just want to try something new. I want to try surfing. It's just been his life ever since, which is pretty cool. Um, yes, it's for yeah. free. That's what I like about it. Yeah, that's what well, is it free? The amount of surfboards that we've got stacked in the garage, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, you can talk to him about that. He only really needs a couple, but you'll get yeah, you'll go yeah. from a big board to a short board. Yeah, he's got he's got some short boards. He's yeah stacked. And it'll change to a fishtail at some point. So yeah, I don't know what he's got in there, but um, yeah, we made friends really easily. Actually, um, a lot of my friends. This sounds really strange, but it was made through Instagram. Yeah. Um. So yeah, kind of made a really good group of girlfriends as soon as. Are they are they migrants, Zoe, or are they like Aussies? Uh. So yeah, most of them are migrants. Um who i mean a couple of them have been here probably just two two or three years longer than us um and then we met um dave and vicky wilson really early on um and we became really good friends with them so they're kind of probably some of our closest family friends here in more duckers yeah 
Um, and yeah, a lot of them, I mean, some of my friends I've made through work, some of them are mums from school and from childcare. So yeah, some Australians, but I think the majority are actually English. <laughs> it's, it's so cool, isn't it? Like lots of my wife's friends and all that are all the school mums and all that. And it, it's just awesome. Like, yeah. it, I think it's really welcoming. Um, that's what we found as well. Like even I'm an Aussie, but you're moving to a small town, like everyone's really welcoming. It's just nice. They are. Everyone is so friendly and really, really kind and they just can't do enough for you, which is, yeah, really lovely. Yeah. A um, couple more questions for you. So James, um, business analyst um, and everything like that, how did he find um, work when he got here? You obviously went straight to work, as you mentioned earlier. Was, was it a struggle for him to get work or he was all right? Um, I think at the time that we arrived, we just got really lucky with everything because there wasn't really – much in the way of immigration at the time. I mean, you had to have a travel exemption to even get here. So when we arrived, there wasn't really, um, there was tons of jobs out for like IT jobs. So he just started applying through Seek and he went through an agency, I think, like a recruitment agency. And so he started contracting straight away um, and yeah, was really lucky, ended up contracting for Discovery Holiday Parks, um, who were Australia wide. And he ended up getting a permanent position through them. And he's just progressed and progressed with them. So he's been there since we since we got here. And he's just, yeah, doing really well with them. But, yeah, there's, there was a lot of, at the time that we arrived, I think we just landed at the right time because there was just a lot of job opportunity for him. And because um, you guys got married in Australia, did you? We did. Nice. I told you. I said, I'm mates with you on Facebook. I remember yeah. seeing like things there and how was that though like did you fly family back or did you yeah what what, Uh, how did that work it was incredible so we decided to have a micro wedding up in northern Queensland in a place called Port Douglas and if no one's heard of Port Douglas you need to google it because it's the most beautiful place in the world um so yeah we got married up there and we basically bought didn't buy we rented out a little beach shack um for a couple of nights and we just got married in the front of it on the beach and then we decided to take all of our little wedding party there was 18 guests and we went on a river cruise um to see some crocodiles and then went back to the little beach shack afterwards and the event company set up some tables and we had a private chef come um and cook for us and yeah it was just stunning yeah, sounds like you would have got some happy snaps there as well, eh? The crocodiles. Yeah. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. No, it was beautiful. And the day before that, we took them all out onto the Great Barrier Reef um, to do some snorkeling, which was really fun, and the helicopter ride and stuff like that. But yeah, it was just amazing—the most beautiful wedding I could have imagined. So yeah, sounds good. What about the uh, the best and worst things about immigrating? Oh gosh, I'd say the worst would probably be not having the family support. Yeah. Um, because I mean, it's not that, I don't know. It's, we didn't move to, obviously we didn't ever expect any family support, but here it just, it hits 10 times harder. I think when you have a newborn baby, um, because I was absolutely fine for the first two and a half years that we were here. And then the last kind of six months, I was a bit like, oh my gosh, I don't have my mum around to kind of help. Um, but they have visited twice since he's been born. So we're, we're pretty lucky. But yeah, that's probably the worst thing um, is not having the the support with ch- young children um, and having to pay childcare fees if you're on a 491. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. And look, this is what these podcasts is about. It's, it's, it's about educating others. It's real life stories, isn't it? Yeah. Like, we're not even telling a thing. It's just... Just having a chat, seeing what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. So, but I think know, it, I, does, uh, it does kind of even out because I mean, we get to watch our, our kids grow up in this environment. And if I, I mean, every time I put the news on and hear about what's happening in the UK, it just, oh, it just sends shivers down my spine because I just think we're so lucky to live here because it's just we live in such a safe area. Um, it's really laid back and chilled, and the kids can just run around on the beach and just just not have a worry in the world. And that's just, it's just so worth it to be here. It is weird, isn't it? Like um, my kids, like um, uh, Jack's, me, like my middle kid, um, he just turned seven, like a couple of weeks ago, oh, like a week ago for today, actually, exactly a week ago today. There you go. Um, and um, it's so weird. He's been catching the bus from, from school um, just with his mates, like as a bit of a treat on like a Thursday or, you know, we might alternate with a Friday. And it just gets the bus. Now, legitimately, it's just on the um, 
on the Nepean Highway in the morning to, you know, the road that, as you've been here before, Zoe, from Dramana pretty much to Portsea, there's one road in and one road out. So it's just there and it takes them to like one of the footy ovals. Um, but you just think like you probably couldn't get away. You, I mean, you probably could do that in the UK, I guess, depending where you were. But where we were in London, that wouldn't even be like, you know, a thought as parents to be able to do that when he comes home and says, can I catch the bus with my friends? Cause they get on at school and then there's, it goes, well, again, it's very safe. It has one and like, they get on at school and then that there's one stop where it ends, yeah. um, which is kind of your house. But that little bit of independency that he gets, you know, yeah. like getting the bus with his mates and, you know, he's just turned seven. So he's been doing it since he was, you know, five and a half, six years old. It's cool. Yeah. And that's it. I, like, I just wouldn't be able to do that in the UK. Like even where I was from, it was a pretty safe area, but I still there was still some crime and yeah, I don't know. I just think we're just incredibly lucky and fortunate to be here. I mean, we live opposite the schools that my son goes to um, now, so he could just cross the road and we can just stand from our balcony and wave at him as he walks into the gate. So we're we're pretty lucky. I mean, he hasn't done that yet because he's um, only just turning six, but um, yeah, it won't be long. I don't think until he's doing that. Yeah, and it won't be long till he's in grade six and you've got all his mates and all that rocking up to yours, getting a snack after school. Well, that's it, yeah. Sneaking, I, sneaking in at lunchtime. I already have parents saying, oh, can so-and-so just pop over to yours for an hour after school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Child care. <laughs> probably true. probably work out really well, actually. I know. Was, um, I start charging. <laughs> that was the case. I remember Twiggy and Sime used to live across the road from from the school. Um, chaos is over. Obviously, do you, get, do you get trouble with parking or like it's all right? Like all the parents drop offs and all that, or it's okay? I mean, everyone's pretty respectful, to be honest. Um, and you just wave at everyone as you walk by, and it's only for ten minutes twice a day, so it doesn't really bother me, to be honest. I think it's a good word you use, respectful. Probably yeah. a good word to sort of when you talk about living in Australia. It probably. That's what I find. It is kind of respectful. Everyone sort of, you know, obviously there's police and all that here and, you know, there's crime, I'm sure, and all that as well. There's like stuff goes on, but again, depending where you live, but everyone just generally seems to to get along. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not everywhere, listeners. Obviously there's, you know, some areas of Australia then you know, it's not here to prove a point, which is safer or not not safer, but, you know, that word respectful sort of definitely where I am, it sounds like where you are, Zoe, as well, it's 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 there. and it's yeah, um, 100%. It's just it's there on show. You can walk down the street and just say hi to everyone and, um, yeah, I mean, you could leave your dog tied up and, like, without any worries and, yeah, I mean, I've left, I leave the door unlocked, probably shouldn't advertise that, um, but a lot of the time when, you know, if I'm just popping to the, to the school, like, opposite, like, it's just, I know that everyone around here doing the school run would look and see if anyone was trying to break in my house and help, so... <laughs> I don't think many people lock their doors, to be honest. When I grew up, we never locked our doors, ever. I'm the youngest of four boys, so good luck trying to come into our house anyway. But we, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's just a thing. And what about work life um, compared to the UK and Australia? What, what's it like? Is it similar? Is it on par, better, worse? Um, so I would say that as a nurse, um, what I found is that I have taken a little bit of a step back. So in the UK, I was quite senior in my position um, and I'd been at the same hospital for 10 years and I think I knew everyone that worked there. Um, so, and yeah, I was doing really well. And when I came here, I did have to take a step back because I guess some of that experience wasn't really recognized. And I can't speak for what it's like in the public sector because I came straight into the private sector here. Um, so I work in a fertility clinic um, as an IVF nurse. So it's all kind of privatized here. Um, but in saying that, although I started at a junior level when we arrived, I have progressed into a more senior role now. Um, but even as a junior, my salary was kind of double that it was in the UK. Um, so, and with far less responsibility. So that was quite nice. And would, the same, oh, sorry. I was going to say like, but cost of living and all that, like, do you guys, would you say you live a better life with both working here, doing what you're doing, um, than compared to in the UK? Yeah. Listen, in the UK, I mean, we were living paycheck to paycheck. Um, it wasn't, our mortgage was quite high. Um, we were just, yeah, I don't know what we were doing with our money, but we just didn't really have a lot of it. Um, but coming here, um, we noticed a difference straight away. I mean, like I say, I was on double my salary. My husband was on three times the amount that he was in the UK. Um, and we are 
incredibly fortunate to stay where we are now but yeah our, our standard of living here is just I mean I know it's not the same for everyone um it's probably just the positions that we found ourselves in but we are incredibly fortunate and, and have you bought sorry are you like, um, so rent, we're, you we're renting at the moment um until we get our permanent residency because another thing about coming on a temporary visa on the 491 is that if you want to buy a house you have to apply to the foreign investors board to be able to buy a house and at the 7%? moment sorry seven percent still is it so that's the stamp duty is seven percent on top of the standard three percent so it works out to like ten percent you're paying stamp duty but also you have to apply to the foreign investors board which costs at the moment i think about twenty three thousand dollars um so you've got those fees on top of your stamp duty that's um, massive that's yeah huge. and for us like we could I mean a lot of people say oh well we're gonna buy because we're gonna spend three years of rent anyway so we're gonna that's gonna balance out but for us we wanted to test different areas we didn't just want to buy straight away and then think oh no we don't like this area that we're living in um, because then it's just you know we'd be stuck somewhere that we didn't want to be so we've rented two different houses now so one closer to Adelaide and then one down south where we are now and we just know that this is where we want to be now so if we hadn't have spent those you know two and a half years figuring it out um then we could have ended up where we were and not be as happy as we are so 100 percent. the beauty of choice is that we get lots of clients say oh look we want to come to australia and do a recce mm. and, you know for some people it works out really good because they can figure out where they want and others you know might come back and say oh we just spent 20 grand on flights accommodation mm. we didn't really get to see too much when we were there you know in that time and you think, yeah, it's tough, but then at least you gave it a go. So it's one of those things, isn't it? There's no real right or wrong. It's um, Yeah. But individual. then also by doing that, if they didn't find the right area, they can say, well, actually, we don't want to live in the areas that we've visited. So they, they have kind of achieved something, I guess, by coming. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's so interesting. It's hard because I always think, like, you know, if you visit an area for a week, is that what life's going to be like? You know, I can go on holiday somewhere. I think it's the best place in the world. Yeah. But is it right? So, again, it's that whole thing, isn't it? It's so individual um, yeah. choices. And that's uh, like I, we always life, thought, isn't it? We thought we'd end up in Queensland always. I was like, I'd love to live in Queensland. It would just be incredible. And then, I mean, we've holidayed there now four times in the last couple of years. And I just, I couldn't do the summers. Like, it's just, yeah. I don't know. I just, I love Adelaide. I think we've got such a lovely climate and yeah, I couldn't be where it's where, I mean, it barely rains here. Um, I know it's not the same for you in Melbourne. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, um, yeah. It's, it's not very rainy here at all. Um, so I couldn't deal with all the, the wet weather that Queensland brings. So, but yeah, it's, you have to try different areas out or try different suburbs and, you know, just to find And there's also place. nothing wrong if your favorite place being a holiday as well, is it? You know what yeah, I mean? Of course. But it can get to be reasonably easy. Place. Yeah, my favourite place is Port Douglas and up near Cairns. Um, we just love going up there. So, But we've got the best of both because we can live in this beautiful area and still just a three-hour plane ride away, just get to one of the most beautiful places in the world. So, yeah. You love fishing. Has you been fishing up there yet? Have no, you guys been fishing? We're, we're not fish eaters. So I just think, oh, wow. what's the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, fair play. Fair play. <laughs> I wish we were, but we're not. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, it's beautiful up there. Yeah. Um, so this has been um, awesome. You've been such a great guest, and I wish um, you and the family um, just obviously the best life you guys can give, and hopefully your one nine one um can get granted. But thank you so much for taking the time. No um, worries. Thank to, you for having me. It's been it's been fun. No, our pleasure, and we'll probably we'll probably check in in like a year or so as well, and just sort of um, you know, if you're happy to do that, and just just sort of see how life is um, getting there. But congratulations, you've done a wonderful job. You've got everyone settled, and um, everyone seems to be happy. No, um, so that's what life's about, isn't it? A hundred percent. You just got to be happy. That's all it is. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Zoe. And guys, we'll um, catch you on the next podcast. All right. Take everyone. Keep safe. <laughs>